welcome everybody. I want to welcome everybody to our evening panel. Uh, my name is David Herman. I'm from the University of Virginia, Slavic department. Um, first of all, an announcement on the program. We have three talks, but in reality, there will only be two. The third speaker, Yelena Karatkova, is not here. Um, so this evening, we're going to have talks by Annie Coco Bobo first. Um, University of Kansas, Slavic department. Um, Annie is an assistant professor of Russian literature at Kansas. Her edited volume, Russian Writers and the Fin de Siècle, Twilight of Realism, is forthcoming from Cambridge University Press in, well, this summer. She's completing a monograph and working on a book of translations. Her articles have appeared in Slavic Review, Russian Review, and Tolstoy Studies Journal. And, uh, I will leave it to her to give you her title. So now I give you Annie Kukubobo. Hello, sorry, <laughs> I just want to make sure you hear me. My title, um, Why Does Russia Need Haji Murad's Head? Haji Murad and Stability in Dagestan. Um, and that question is not my own. It, this question comes from an article published by journalist and Islam scholar Abdullah Muhammadov on the website uh, Kafkaskaya Politika in April 2013. And I'll quote from that article. They say, writes Muhammadov, that a war only ends the moment when the last of its fighters is buried. The Caucasian War was formally completed nearly 150 years ago. Yet, to this day, the head of Haji Murad a monumental figure in Caucasian history remains unburied, end quote. As we know, of course, most of us by reading Tolstoy's novella, um, Haji Murad's head was cut off uh, after he died in a skirmish with Russian soldiers and was never laid to rest um, along with his body in Azerbaijan. Um, and I have a picture of his head. And can show you. Um, it presently resides in the Kunstkamera Museum. There you go, <laughs> the head of Haji Murad. There you go. Oh. So, okay, thank you. Um, and I'll have more on the head in a moment. Um, it, it presently resides at the Kunstkamera Museum of Anthropology and Ethnography in St. Petersburg, where it makes for the perfect museum display object, complete with the eerie label, exhibit number 119. Um, seemingly forgotten by Russia's power that powers that be, Haji Murad's head is, of course, very important in the imagination of a number of less central domains in the Russian Federation and beyond. In Russia's regions, Haji Murad's descendants and the Dagestani people have been attempting for quite some time um, to have his skull returned to its rightful place. Um, as an aside, they're not sure what that rightful place is, uh, and this is part of the problem. Some believe that it might be in Dagestan, where he's from. Um, others that it should go to Azerbaijan, where his body is currently buried. Um, and then, of course, the question of whether they need to be buried together or not comes up. Um, and I even read something completely outlandish, which was that Haji Murad's head could be buried in Tolstoy's estate in Yastam, but yeah, no. <laughs> Join, joining Tolstoy, perhaps. Um, I didn't. That, I made that last part out, but the Yasna Poliana actually is true. Um, Haji Murad's head also seems to have an active place in cyberspace. It has inspired. Oh, here. Um, it has. How to maximize it, but um, it has it has inspired a page on the Russian social network site of Kontaktia with over 300 members, which is absurdly titled "Haji Murat, Let's Return the Head to the Hero," literally, Giroyu. It's not Giroyu. <laughs> uh, moreover, uh, Haji Murat, or rather his head, is the so-called protagonist of a YouTube video with over 17,000 hits and. That's a video I can show later um, if there's time. We don't need to. But one thing that's uh, relevant about the video is that two Russian scholars from the Kunstkamera Museum, and one of them I think is the director of the Kunstkamera, are handling exhibit 119 and examining it. And they, they're noticing the preserved teeth and then the wound dealt to the temple. We do not have Haji Murad's head here, merely his skull, insists one of the scholars. Um, 
hoping that this sort of scientific distinction will diffuse the tension evoked by this very disturbing visual of him handling someone's skull. Um, it's this perfectly bureaucratic video. Um, now, whether it's in the form of a video footage from YouTube or the cyber reality of, contact, of Contacti or a curse believed to plague Haji Murad's family since his death and improper burial, um, and they really believe this, um, Haji Murad, or more specifically his severed skull, have acquired an unusually significant symbolic value in Dagestan's and I would say also Russia's contemporary culture. In what follows, I would like to consider this rich afterlife, focusing primarily on literary treatments of Haji Murad's severed head, um, as well as contemporary cultural initiatives that the hero has inspired in his native Dagestan. While Haji Murad's head is trapped in Russia's former imperial center, like a prized colonial treasure, much public discourse and activity centers on his person in Dagestan. As I argue, this significant contrast in how Haji Murad's legacy is treated points to important geopolitical questions revolving around Dagestan's status as a region within the Russian Federation and Moscow's ultimately centric and disconnected, perhaps, perspective on the tenor of things in Mkhachkala. Um, thinking about literary depictions of Haji Murat and the significance that the hero in his head, of all things, have assumed in the public imagination, uh, Tolstoy's 1904 novella, Haji Murad, is the most important treatment of the hero and his life as Imam Shamil's naib during the Caucasian Wars. Haji Murad's head makes a vivid appearance toward the end of the novella as the Russian soldiers stationed in the Caucasus fought a Cossack approaching with an officer. I mean, you know, the two men have been commissioned to go village to village in the North Caucasus and show people Haji Murad's severed head. <laughs> What speech do you make when you show the head, is asked Kamenev by someone. And he doesn't manage to respond because the major, um, Ivan Madvievich, insists on kissing Haji Murad's severed head um, while calling him a fine fellow. The Russian officers are struck by the severed head, of course, and saddened to see that he has perished. Um, but it's only Maria Dmitrievna, the mistress of Ivan Madvievich, who expresses moral disgust at the sight of a human head paraded around like a trophy. She calls the officers cutthroats and does not accept the ability, uh, excuse me, the alibi that violence is natural in war. A dead body should be given back to the earth, she declares, while they're grinning at it. Haji Murad's head is paraded around to show the locals what happened to those who dare resist the Russians, of course. This reinforcing Russia's aggressive policies toward the regions began by the notorious General Romolov. Tolstoy, I would argue, intentionally does not permit this voice of colonial domination in his text, preferring to focus on Maria Dmitrievna's moral condemnation instead. Even more importantly, he chooses not to end the story with the ominous image of Haji Murad's severed head as a passive object in a sack. That same Kamenev, who is not permitted to voice the Russian Empire's violent colonialist message, expansively recounts uh, told, uh, Haji Murad's nearly Homeric courage in his fight to the death against the Russians. At the end of the narrative, the defeated Haji Murad is anything but a victimized opponent. As Tolstoy likely knew, uh, however, the words that he did not allow Kamenev to speak would have also been partly redundant because they were already verbalized in a private correspondence about Haji Murad's head between Prince Vorontsov, who appears in the novella, and Tsar Nicholas I, and this is historical, of course. Um, in a letter from May 1st, 1852, Vorontsov writes, quote, they sent, and he just says the head, um, they sent Haji Murad's head from Zakatal, it arrived, as they told me, in excellent condition, and is now in the hospital. I look at it with curiosity. This man, the terror of so many people and provinces, truly died. It is good that it ended this way, responds Nicholas. Here is new proof about what comes from trusting these cunning bandits. Um, Nicholas and Vronsov speak of Haji Murad's severed head very differently, of course, from how Tolstoy or any of his characters do. Vronsov looks at the head with strange curiosity, or as a strange curiosity object, whereas Nicholas gloats at what has happened likely sending someone like Kamenev village to village in order to perpetuate this triumphant gloating. Uh, 
the curiosity, but all the more so the gloating and the description of mountaineers as cunning bandits, reek, of course, of prejudicial colonialist language. And here I'm quoting um, from Franz Fanon. I came into this world anxious to discover the meaning of things. My soul desires to be at the origin of the world, and this is Paris. Um, and here I am an object among other objects, writes the Algerian psychiatrist and post-colonial thinker, Franz Fanon, about the experience of being a black man in Paris and being seen as an other. In the correspondence between Voronsov and Nikolai, Hajimurats is an essential colonial treasure, a vision of a great warrior uh, reduced to an object or a doorstop. From the perspective of Nicholas I, Hajimurad's head represent, represents a, le, a rebel silenced and rendered immobile. And perhaps it's a prelude to the end of the North Caucasus resistance, which sure enough would come five years later with the 1857 surrender of Imam Shamil. In Tolstoy's story, however, we encounter an embrace of this otherness in the connections Hajimurad forms with Russians, particularly with Maria Dmitrievna and Butler who seemed to be the most disturbed by the side of his head. In the novella, Tolstoy presents a culturally sensitive attitude toward his hero, or for the most part anyway, um, including many original elements of, his, of the hero's Islamic faith, which he strove to understand quite in depth, rather than superimposing his own religious and cultural beliefs, which we know he held very dear. Um, indeed, it's only Tsar Nicholas that bears the brunt of Tolstoy's criticism as a lecherous and cruel despot looking to subject everyone to his will. Tolstoy had no patience for Nicholas's fear-inducing tactics or violent imperial designs. In his own text, he therefore refuses to colonize Hajimurat, letting the hero's own story speak for itself. It is likely due to this rare cultural sensitivity that Tolstoy and his novella remain extremely popular in the North Caucasus, while other 19th century figures like General Hermolov or, or even Lermontov, to give a more neutral example, um, are disliked or universally hated in the case of Ramolov. Um, in his memoirs, Dagestan's national poet, Rasul Khamzatov, mentions that reading Tolstoy Saji Murad, a very old man in his native village, believed that, and I quote, only the Lord himself could have authored such a truthful book, end quote. Um, Haji Murad, and more specifically his unburied head, also appears in 20th century literature from Russia's regions. Haji Murad's head um, is discussed in a 1968 poem titled The Head of Haji Murad, written in Avar by the Dagestani national poet Rasul Gamzatov. If the Russian perspectives, however sympathetic in Tolstoy's case, were historically accurate, and showed in one way or another the defeat and death of Haji Murad, this more recent Dagestani depiction presents a regional anti-historical outlook on events. In the poem, the narrator sees Haji Murad's decapitated head while listening to the battle roars and blood flowing on the barren stone in the turbulent, I'm quoting here, um, villages, owls. Um, images of brave murids uh, arise as the lyrical persona discerns glistening sabers. In the midst of this glory, the poet questions the bloody head about its fall from grace, despite having received great honor in the past. The decapitated head responds that it's been lost since falling off Haji Murad's shoulder, which is a little bit surreal, um, adding that it did not choose the best path due to vanity. This last sentence, of course, launches us into a larger symbolic discourse in the poem whereby Haji Murad's head actually functions as a stand-in for Dagestan. The poet uses the idea of the fallen head to suggest that the North Caucasus mountain people, although inherently a great people, now find themselves somewhat downtrodden. Um, and then he, of course, ends by urging them to return to their former glory. And here I quote, men born of the mountains, we must, dead or alive, one way or the other, rise again to greatness, end quote. Whereas within the realist parameters of Tolstoy's novella or Nicholas's callous letter, uh, historical realities cannot be averted. Gamzatov allo allows poetic license to take over, and Hachimurat's head, although it's shown as bloody, grows into a symbol of something larger. It tells the story of the nation. Indeed, one cannot make sense of the poem or the discussion of the severed head without you know, losing its way from vanity without um, extrapolating this larger symbolic significance and potential for healing therein. 
the head can be symbolically reunited with its body when the Dagestanis um, symbolically and literally find their way in the, poet, in the poem's opinion. In the sense, the history penned by the colonizer is countered with, original, with a regional poetic narrative that allows for agency and healing and does not reduce the colonized into a passive object. And I would argue that Haji Murad remains relevant in our time as well for a number of reasons. Um, aside from the cyberspace activity that I've been mentioning, there's also a number of initiatives commemorating the hero. Um, in 2012, there were two monuments um, that were erected. This one is in Makhachkawa, and this is in Haji Murad's Hunzauk. Uh, it's in the village where he's from. Um, the hope had been, of course, that the head would have been returned by then, maybe buried alongside one of these monuments. Um, like the Gamzatov poem or Tolstoy's own narrative even, these monuments commemorate and honor the hero. In fact, I would argue that they're distinctly anti-historical, given that the hero um, is celebrated um, that the hero celebrated in both monuments is not the historical Haji Murad, but actually Tolstoy's Haji Murad. Um, while the Kremlin has had its trouble with troubles with Dagestan, a, a vibrant cultural exchange, I would say, is, is taking place between Dagestan and Tolstoy's Yasne Polyana, and even the whole province of Tula. In addition to the monuments, there is also oh, this monument <laughs> in Yasne Polyana, which is a little bit um, perhaps less refined, um, it, it, but it, it also commemorates the, the, the novella that's donated is from Haji Murad's village, and of course the thistle. Um, <laughs> it's the thistle. <laughs> I, um, um, I think this is from 2013 or 2014. Um, I have to check it up. I'm sorry that I don't I don't have that information. Um, and there's also, this is from uh, November 2014, I just read this, there's an exhibit that was opening, that was open in November in Mahachkala, dedicated to the writing of Haji Murad that includes a, a whole replica of Tolstoy's study materials replicated from Yasna Poliana, um, some of the background materials that Tolstoy read, and this is now in, in a museum, and I, I think it's part of a larger series, Tolstoy in the Caucasus. And I know that um, Tolstoy's great-grandson went there for these, for, I think at least for the unveiling of this monument. I don't know if he was in the village. Um, as Fanon has suggested, violence is the catharsis of the colonized, um, his means of self-empowerment from the state of colonized specificity. This was surely the case in the North Caucasus during the 19th century, whereas Robert Ware has argued it, is, it was the pressures of Russian colonialism that ultimately led to the unification of the North Caucasus and Holy War um, under Shamil. The violent and deeply imperialistic Nikolaevan approach in many respects backfired. It's for this reason that the image of Haji Murad's head in a museum box is so disturbing and I think relevant and still worth thinking about. It can be read as an epitome of colonial violence, tantamount to Nicholas's gloating and a constant reminder of Russia's violent conquest of the Caucasus. This reminder is problematic given that to this day and age, Haji Murad's story still holds geopolitical significance as Russia continues to struggle in the region, most recently in Dagestan. Um, and when it comes to any sort of insurgent in the area, the power that the powers that be in the center seem to always rely on this Nikolaev and approach of aggressive um, imperial conquest, not conquest because it's the 21st century, but something akin to that. Um, put it another way, they seem to always prefer to keep Haji Murad's head in a museum in order to instill fear and show their power. And I'm referring here to some decisions made um, in our times by Dagestan's new president, um, Ramazan Abdul Atipov, um, which, again, I mean, he made the decisions, but many knew that these decisions were in keeping with the Kremlin's agendas. Abdul Atipov is a faithful United Russia member and Putin strongman. Um, he was essentially appointed leader of Dagestan in 2013 um, to replace the former president, Magomedov. Um, Abdul Atipov seems to have been successful in many respects, particularly in curbing corruption. 
but less successful in dealing with Islamic terrorism and armed insurgency in the region, and just in the country at least. Um, as people in, and as some scholars and in international organizations like the International Crisis Group have suggested, the reason for this failures is that he has been largely relying on these hardline policies. There was a, what people have called the Dagestan model under Magomedov, which was essentially meant that fundamentalists were seen as part of the country's life and therefore trying to integrate them into their life and engage them into problem solving was seen as a way to discourage armed rebellion. A number of cultural initiatives were developed to forge open dialogue with moderate Salafi leaders and it's the Salafis that are considered the more fundamentalist um, of the groups. They were allowed to even create an association of scholars, um, people of the Sunna, Kulu Sunna, um, where they developed their own plans for reducing tensions among young people through education. This, uh, the idea was then by offering religious youth the opportunity to practice in mosques oh, openly, um, extremist acts would then subside. And there was also a commission for rehabilitating some extremist fighters um, who obviously didn't want to continue uh, in that path. In some ways, I would like to think of this Dagestan model as a Tolstoyan approach, perhaps, to the problem. And it can then, of course, be contrasted to the other model, the Chechnya model, which involves a more heavy-handed approach um, to militants and their supporters, with the end goal being to eradicate fundamentalism altogether. And um, Kadir's regime in Chechnya has been repressive um, of fundamentalists, but also essentially of all citizens, and I know Gizi will talk about that tomorrow at length, um, or perhaps about the antithesis of that. Uh, but, but being, of course, he's tough on corruption as well, but I think he's probably even tougher on the Chechen people. French journalist Manon Lozeau recently suggested in a documentary that's called War Without a Trace that present-day Chechens basically live in fear um, as peace with the Russians has given way to what she calls the Chechenization of the war, turning Chechens themselves into enforcers on their own people. Unsurprisingly, or surprisingly, um, <laughs> Chechnya is held up as a model republic in Russia, and Kadyrov was recently awarded with the Order of Honor for conscientious work. Uh, it's very complicated, <laughs> not go into too much into that. But anyway, however successful or unsuccessful this last model, um, the Dagestan model seemed to be working. Um, according to the Independent News Service, uh, Caucasus Nod, in 2012, um, when these sort of more enlightened policies were implemented, the number of victims, number of conflict victims fell by 15% and youth seemed to be participating in insurgency less. But these gentler policies are of course being discontinued. After visiting Chechnya in 2013, Abdul Latifov publicly expressed admiration for the Chechen model. Um, so he began implementing similar policies in Dagestan, perhaps under some pressure from Putin due to some mounting anxieties about the Sochi Olympics approaching and security questions. Um, the International Crisis Group has suggested that a number of these hardline policies um, included, which included, I think, stopping the program for the rehabilitation of extremists and essentially driving most Salafi activities underground. Um, they've suggested that these have been counterproductive in the end. Um, there's a lot of repression that happened, or I think is still happening. I'm not 100% sure of, you know, the situation on the ground at this moment, but uh, we know that there was a, an attack on the village of Gimri. This is a famous village for a number of reasons, including that it's the birthplace of Shamil, and it remains, I think, fairly fundamentalist to this day, and they're very attached to their anti-colonial past, but um, we know that the military barged in with something like 4,000 law enforcement officers, and only three extremists were actually taken or killed, um, and something like 4,600 residents were displaced homes damages and looted. So this sort of aggression obviously can't but breed more and more resentment and perpetuate this vicious cycle of violence. So 
again, and I think of this as a more Nikolaevan approach to the problem. And in closing, I would like to return to the question of my title, which is why indeed does Russia need Haji Murad's head? Um, I mean, is it because being in control of the North Caucasus or having a Putin square and the newly rebuilt Grozny is somehow not enough? Or keeping Haji Murad's, is keeping Haji Murad's head in a museum equivalent to that self-satisfied gloating from Nicholas? Is no amount of power ever enough? Um, is Haji Murad perhaps simply forgotten? Um, I don't have an answer to any of these questions, <laughs> except to say that I think they're important and should be raised um, more often. Haji Murad's head, I think, is only a small piece of the, of the puzzle in a series of questions um, that we could ask about contemporary Russia. I mean, why does Russia need you know, anything? You could insert a lot of different signifiers in that space. Um, but I think it's an issue with deep-seated symbolic significance when it comes to Russia's relationship with its North Caucasus citizens. So for what it's worth, um, Russia really doesn't need Haji Murad's head for anything at all. Um, so, you know, I think it should give it back. And, and to, to quote the journalist I quoted in the beginning, I think that would really perhaps close a bloody chapter in its past, even as others are perpetually being opened. So with that, I will end.